like that, right? Where they're just like so open and liberal and they like have to make you aware of that fact. Greetings and salutations and welcome to Hacker Slash. If you're joining us again, welcome back. You know I can't give you the keys, right babe? If this is your first time listening, welcome to the party. We are a horror movie review podcast dedicated to telling you whether a movie is a hack, a total joke, a waste of time, or a slash. Totally killer, pun intended. We believe horror is for everyone, and as such, we're rating these movies with the perspective we've all gained from our varying walks of life and the flavors of fear we fancy most. My name is Chris. I'm your friendly neighborhood slasher enthusiast. This week, I'm joined by the Superfly Space Guy, Mac. Hola, muchachos. The Gore Lover, Alexis. Hey, everyone. The Cowardly Creeper, Ryan. I mean... I told you not to go in that house. And the Scream Queen, Paris. If there's too many white people, I get nervous. This week, we're checking out an Academy Award-winning 2017 film that remained in the top 10 for the U.S. box office for two months after its release. Before we get down to business, though, we have some follow-up. Let's follow up on a movie. So, speaking of top 10s, we recently reviewed The Lodge. And so far, that's one of the top 10 slashiest slashes of the year. Wow. We haven't done 10, but I think right now it's the current reigning best performing thus far. But of course, we wanted to hear what our listeners thought. 21% of our listeners actually hacked the lodge and 79% gave it a slash. An overwhelming majority. Yeah, despite like how emotionally heavy that movie was, people seem to still resonate with it. We have a comment from one of our listeners, Jules, who said, I was genuinely surprised and delighted that it received a universal slash. I saw The Lodge in theaters the week it came out, and I was one of the two people in the room which doesn't exactly scream well-received. It was nice to hear that I wasn't the only one who liked this psychological thriller. Yeah, I feel like it came across as that, and I don't know. I feel like horror movies, unless they're extremely popular, if they're kind of like indie, they don't, they're not as well-received in movie theaters. I feel like a lot of people watch for them to come out on video. It's also the type of movie where you're going to feel something while watching it and after watching it for sure. And not everyone is down for that. Sometimes people just want a good like slashy time. Exactly. We have another comment from one of our listeners, Taylor, who said this. I was completely ready to hack this movie when I saw Alicia Silverstone. That being said, I absolutely loved this movie. I watched it directly after Honeydew. So you could say I was in the right frame of mind for a mind bending thriller. I'm not usually one for a slow burn, but this does it in a way where I was never bored and always on the edge of my seat. I'm not sure what these kids expected to happen, but I had a hard time not sympathizing with their struggle a little bit. The dad was completely idiotic. I was surprised to note that no one mentioned him giving Grace a gun just to leave her alone with his children in an isolated environment. That was the worst part of the film for me. Every decision he made was in his own best interest, and he never considered anyone else for even a second. Taylor, you're a queen. Thank you for pointing out all this bullshit. We needed you here to point out uh, that dad being a reckless person. Although, now that you mention Honeydew, I do realize that I did hate this movie the first time I saw it, then saw Honeydew, and then loved this movie after. So maybe it's a pairing there that I thought this one was better by comparison. Who knows? Interesting. So we're eating Honeydew in the lodge. Got it. And finally, we have a comment from Alex who said, This film is better than The Turning, which also stars Finn, but it's only one notch above that film. Unfortunately, still a hack though. A slow burn for little to no payoff. If you want to watch a good gaslighting film, watch 2009's Afterlife with Liam Neeson and Christina Ricci. And I'll say this, Alex, I have never heard of this movie, but I love Christina Ricci and I'm probably going to watch it. I also think I'm a little tapped out on gaslighting movies for a bit. Yeah, I think so too. But I'm okay with this hack. I just want to know, there was so much interesting interaction on Discord and I loved hearing everybody's opinion about this movie because there was so much to be said from everybody. Everybody felt differently about this. And that's our follow up. Well, in 2008, Jordan Peele took inspiration from both Eddie Murphy's stand-up and Democratic primary discussions to form the seed of an idea that would ultimately blossom into his directorial debut. Peele felt the process of writing the screenplay would make him a better artist, but as the climate under Obama's first presidential term felt like renewed optimism and progression from racism, he felt he was ultimately writing the project for himself. As time marched forward, however, the Black Lives Matter movement continued to grow in the midst of increased discussions surrounding systemic racism and increasing violence against African Americans. Peele ultimately realized the time was right to bring the project to reality. After 200 screenplay drafts, 23 days of production, and a rigorous post-production and testing period, audiences in 2017 watched the film Peel had begun all those years ago. A film about a young black man meeting his white girlfriend's parents for the first time, and the growing unease as he realizes their overbearing hospitality is far more sinister than he anticipated. That film ultimately saw such incredible success 
that Peel became the first African-American writer, producer, and director to earn more than $100 million in a debut film. This week, we're talking about Get Out. Who's seen this one before? Oh my god, I saw this movie. Unsurprising. Cue cheers right now. (laughs) I saw this in theaters. I was super excited and stoked, and I feel like I saw it opening weekend. I definitely did the same thing, Alexis. I remember there was a lot of hype surrounding this movie, and it was something where I was like, I need to go and see this before it gets spoiled for me, because I know it's going to be great. So when this came out, I thought, oh, I'm going to watch that soon, because it looks great. Then it was available for streaming rental, and I thought, "Uh, I'll stream this soon. Then I joined the podcast and thought, I'm sure we'll cover this soon. And here we are. I finally watched it. Um, So I'm happy, but it's still my first time. So, Mac, at least you and I have this in common that I didn't watch this movie during its theatrical run. It was one of those things that I knew had come out and I was really excited for. But I think at that point I was working uh, a brand new job and I was still in the midst of finding out, like, what does my social life look like compared to my work life? And I just didn't get out much. But I did watch this movie once it became uh, available for streaming at home. And let me tell you, I was expecting it to be mind-blowing based on the hype that I had heard surrounding it. But there was no way I could have expected how absolutely brilliant it was in layering its storytelling. You know, Chris, I, I also had high expectations because I waited so long that basically everyone around me was like, you need to see this, or Jordan Peele is amazing, or oh my gosh, why haven't you seen this? What's wrong with you? So I went into this like, this is just going to be a stellar movie, but I, I honestly wasn't sure what to expect. I understood like the basics of the story, like meeting the folks and something's wrong, and obviously there's going to be tension, but I, I wasn't sure exactly what the play was going to be. I was not prepared. Yeah, it's interesting because like Paris said, there was a lot of hype around this movie when it was coming out. And I think it's one of those things where once you've seen it, like you don't even have to necessarily love the movie to still walk up to somebody and say, you need to see Get Out if you haven't seen it. I have no idea what I expected going in. This time I thought it was interesting because I expected to just be like, kind of a skim watch. And then in the first second, I was like, oh, I remember hmm, nothing from this. Just I basically remember the synopsis that you get when you rent it. Interesting, because I remembered a good majority and, you know, the twists, the turns, the, you know, expectations. And for me, I was like, I didn't think I was going to be bored, but I thought it was going to be a skim for me. And then watching this for probably only my second time, it just really like captured my attention within the first scene. I was like, I forgot how brilliant this movie is. So even though I knew everything that was going to be going on and remembered a huge chunk of it, I was still presently surprised. You know, I felt like one of the characters in the film. I felt like Rod the entire time because I'm sitting there watching this with my wife and I'm going, no, don't do that. Don't go in there. Get out of there, man. What are you doing? The entire movie. I'll tell you, Mac, the theater audience that I saw this with loved Rod. I think Rod is like really the cipher for all of us as viewers. And like the the number of times everybody went up for Rod was very satisfying. But going into this watch, I actually realized I hadn't watched this movie since I saw it in theaters. And I remember the gist, of course. But similarly to Ryan, there were certain things where I was like, oh, I actually don't remember a lot of this. But it was interesting to watch again, knowing the reality of everything And seeing just how every single choice builds up to what eventually comes to fruition in the end of the movie, sort of retracing our steps narratively to piece together all of the different clues and signs to kind of get us to where the ending is, was very satisfying this time around. Yeah, Paris, it's interesting that you mentioned that because when I was experiencing this film for a second time, having not seen it since that very first viewing at home, it was one of those situations where I was doing the math along the way and trying to pick up the little details where you see what le- what what action causes what effect. It's one of those movies that you cannot watch the same way twice. At least for me, it wasn't. I think I retained a lot more of this movie than... Maybe like Ryan or Alexis did, but it was still really surprising how many other little details were present that just washed over me in my first viewing. So this time around, I felt just as captivated, but in a completely different way than my first viewing. Yeah, Chris, I completely agree with you. There's actors in this movie that you see and then the duality of their actions when you know the first time I watched it I thought it meant one thing and then watching this a second time it it has a totally different meeting and it that just kept me engaged throughout the entire movie 
Yeah, Alexis, I totally agree. I think that while I knew what was going to happen, being able to rewatch this and see all those little details and catch them all, similar to what Chris was saying, was such a different experience. And I think this is only my second time rewatching this. So picking up on all those little pieces was awesome. Of course, I, I knew what happened in the end. It was just the journey that was a lot different this time for me. The other thing is I was reminded of the feelings that like the things that came up in the theater watching this, because this was like a huge theater watch. And you're totally right. Like Rod was a rock star in the theater. Okay. Every time Rod showed up, everybody in the theater screams. And there's one particular moment at the very end of this movie. And I can remember when it happened, when I re saw it this time, I remember where I was and what I felt in the theater when that thing happened. And I was like, oh man, I forgot all about that. So it was a thrilling rewatch for me, honestly. I will say since I'm the only one who's, you know, th- this viewing was my, was my first time, right? So everyone else has seen it at least once, but this was a new experience for me and I felt so much tension. It surprised me because usually I go into a movie and I use my logic constantly and you, yeah, you can use your logic and it probably increases the tension if you address this with logic, but um, it kept me on the edge of my seat. I was not expecting to be on the edge of my seat while watching this, but I felt it. Like I felt it in my gut. I, I remember thinking about this in the middle of the movie going like, why do I feel so tense? Because I know what's going on. I know it's a movie, but like right now, like I am, it's like watching a friend get into trouble and you're like, please don't do it. You know, Mac, I think your description of that tension is the closest we're ever going to get to you being scared. I'm just going to throw that out there. I'm going to make that prediction. I don't think you're ever going to get any, I don't think you're going to get any closer to it than this movie with that tension. I think one of the other things that surprised me, not only in the first time watching the movie, but really surprised me more this time around is how just solid this movie is with making you feel empathy. And we all know like empathy is the gateway drug to a better world and just understanding each other and finding ourselves inside of other people and this movie is stacked with people who are terrible and who do absolutely horrific things but the way that Jordan Peele tells this story evokes so much emotion even beyond just that tension Mac and it's absolutely mind-blowing to me I do have one disappointment and I think it's that I am only seeing this for the second time now I think that's what it is the disappointment is all on me That is quite a disappointment. I'm also seeing this for the second time, but I'm not disappointed in that. I am disappointed in the runtime. And I say that because I feel like I watched this movie and I was really entertained and invested that when it ended, I was like, wow, that was quick. Like I wanted more, want a little bit more action, I think. I think I wanted more investigation from certain characters into why things happen, but I realized that is not what this movie is about. But I wish I was in this movie longer. You want a more gore spread out. Actually, you know what? When there's people I dislike in movies, I want more gore. So that might have been disappointment. You know, Jordan Peele does have a whole backstory fleshed out for the antagonists in this movie. And I think there was the uh, idea of an open door to a sequel. But he has specifically stated that he would only do it for the right reasons, only if it felt good, not for just a cash grab. But maybe if we ever get a second story, you'll get more gore. I'd appreciate that. That's actually the thing that surprised me the most with this watch is I actually remember this movie being like almost completely goreless. And when we do get gore, I was like, oh shit, how did I forget that kill? And how did I forget that kill? So I'm disappointed in myself for having forgotten those. I think though, just when you see this movie for the first time, you're processing so much all at once that it's, it's difficult to absorb and retain everything based on just a single watch. Something that disappointed me, I think is a certain character and pretty much any time they're on the screen. I was like, cut this out. We can, we can lose. And, and like, I can see the, the value in it, but it wasn't for me specifically. Mm. I feel like I know who you're talking about and I feel like I support you. I also have an unpopular opinion that I'll share later about another character that's a little bit of like a sore spot for me. Not like it's like a disappointment, but it's just, I don't know. We will get into all the things, of course. But Paris, you have such a good point. As soon as the gore started, I was like, Oh, I totally forgot. I had just been having the thought, oh, maybe like no one dies in this. I can't really remember like the situation. Um, I was wrong. I was very wrong. That actually reminded me of something else that I 
also forgot because I remembered being disappointed by the mechanics of the ending, like sort of the explanation that we get. I remember being like, mm, I'll go with it, but I'm, I'm not sold. And this time around, I was like, wait, I feel like they really checked every box that I had. I'm not sure what I was disappointed about the first time around. Same. I remembered having a feeling like after you see us and you're kind of like, is the explanation logical? Does it make sense? Do those two things quite tie together? This time I was like, yeah, that makes perfect sense. It's great. Great job, Jordan Peele. Good job. You, you did your job well. I think we just weren't ready in 2017 to like fully appreciate how incredible it is. It's so true because I mean, I don't know. This may be like a, a bit of an overzealous statement, but like I can't think of anything that's been like this and had the impact that this had before it. I mean, of course we've had psychological thrillers, but I've never seen anything like this. I think that's why it's so effective though, because you know, we, we've talked about tension, right? But when, when we're talking about like fear, we like have experienced so much in the last couple of years, like since this movie came out that now gives us all a constant fear for humanity. So I, I think we can really respect this a lot more um, because like we've just gone through so much and so much has been brought to light maybe uh, that now we're just like, Oh yeah. Like people are, are trash. Yeah. I mean, I refuse to live in fear of humanity as a, as it just as an existence. And I I've always thought that people could suck as much as they do in this movie. But yeah, this, this movie is like a, a too realistic kind of fear. Like some, and it's not that the general concept is realistic. It's that like the little things are so realistic that it just makes you think, mm, really only one step away at any moment. Yeah. The motive is real. The broad strokes, the macro, the micro, all of it is really intense and grounded in reality. And that's why this movie isn't the type of jump scare horror that you're going to find in a lot of other, you know, theatrical releases from like the mid, from the 2000s, even starting with that, like, you know, remake renaissance that we started to get. But this movie has a different type of fear, which is that, like, that heaviness, the, you need to sit here and watch this and feel this and again, walk in someone else's shoes and see how they have to move through the world and see how the world moves around them and how in some ways it doesn't move around them. This movie is particularly adept at just like hollowing out those feelings. And I think in some way, some ways it strikes nerves that can be confused with fear, but I think this movie just makes you feel completely it even made me feel and you know i watch horrors to not feel anything but i have to admit there are some jump scares in here and sometimes i watch movies on my laptop and i found out there's like surround sound on this macbook air i'm not sure how that works but uh <laughs> sometimes i hear it in one ear and the other but i watched it on my tv and there's a part where a character just i mean doesn't even pop out it's just subtly in the background but i think what this movie does great is you're paying attention to like the main character the protagonist the antagonist like like you're you're so focused on what's going on in the forefront that you don't notice something in the background. So when something does happen in the background, it is a jump scare. It it was so subtle, but it scared the shit out of me. I definitely remember a very specific jump scare in this movie that got me in the theaters. And then this time around, I like happened to make a comment to my boyfriend right before it happened. So it, I missed it and it didn't get me. Like I'm, I'm fairly certain it would have gotten me again. But Alexis, you're totally right. A lot of the, the scares are less James Wan and more, I want to, I don't want to say art. Jordan Peele. Yeah. And more Jordan Peele. I love that. Uh, he definitely has his own visual language for creating fear, but just like overall as a concept and a premise, this movie is absolutely psychotic and terrifying. It is. And, and, and honestly, that works for the time in which we live, right? Because if there's anything that Jordan Peele knows how to nail, it's, it's capturing the zeitgeist. I think this movie is absolutely a movie of the 20 teens and the early 2020 so far. It obviously like pays homage to concepts from movies before it on purpose, uh, but it captures a cultural feeling in its own and just completely unique kind of way. Agreed. I don't think I've seen another movie like this. And what's interesting is how expertly Jordan Peele takes all these other sources of inspiration. So even like the Night of the Living Dead, the original, right? We have all these horror movies that have come before it. We have pieces of non-horror content and media that he has drawn inspiration from. But he has told a story that you see every day and obviously added layers to this that are like very symbolic and you don't see quite literally this happen every day. But it's amazing to me how stellar this movie is 
at articulating that on screen and being completely original in doing so. Yeah, this is totally original and it does take influence from other horror movies, which I love. There's some Stephen King in there. There's some Shining in there. There's some Halloween. I just love how it's all molded and kind of melts in there. And it's just a nice thing when you're watching. You're like, oh, that's from this. But it's not done in a way where it's like, hey, this is an Easter egg right in your face. Yeah, you can tell it's from an artist who has been exposed to many things and enjoys a lot of things that you do. How awesome is it that someone like Jordan Peele decided to make horror? He could have made so many different types of movies. And I just, it's just so lovely that we get him here because he's such a different, he's such a fresh take on horror. What would we do without Get Out? Where would we be? Like he just goes, he just goes a different direction and I love it so much. Yeah. I also love that he's a lifelong fan of the genre and he really enjoys horror and it's really, It's really great that he's added this, you know, continued fight for legitimacy of the horror genre. Like when this movie came out, there were so many arguments because it was being categorized as a drama or as a comedy. It was being categorized as all these other subgenres because admittedly horror doesn't get the same recognition or appreciation or credibility in Academy Awards. They're seen as inferior films. And what he did with this movie is say, you can have both. You can have horror with depth. And I'm so glad he has continued to fight this fight. I think this movie is beautifully original. I think Jordan Peele brought such a unique perspective when telling this story. And at the time, it was unlike anything we'd ever seen. And really since, nobody's even come close to sort of capturing the energy that this movie has. So originality points across the board. Except for Jordan Peele. He's come the closest to capturing his own feeling. Absolutely. He's the only one that can. Speaking of cans, the end of this movie is exactly what I wanted. It takes the perfect amount of time for me. It does all the things that I would ask for it to do. And the very, very, very end is also great. The whole wrap up is great for me. Okay. So I know you've seen this before, but me going into this on a first viewing, I did not expect this to end the way that it ended. And I'm happy that it did, but the ending, I think, brought more tension and fear than the like entire rest of the movie. And it, w- once you start caring about characters, the ending makes you very nervous. It's stressful. Yes. And there is a very specific quality that makes that happen. And I feel like that is, like you're saying, Mac, it's like the most saturated and most potent form of the feeling that you're feeling in like a mild sense throughout the entire movie. You feel it like on, on turned up to a thousand in these, in these final moments. Uh, and my boyfriend actually told me that they filmed an alternate ending that ends differently the way that you might be afraid it, ex- it ends. No way. And I'm so glad that that's not the one we got because like Ryan said, the ending of this movie does everything you need it to do. And I think I think they made the right choice with the ending that we get. Can you see the alternate ending? Yeah, he says it's on YouTube. What? Yeah, I think it was released with the DVD. Mm. Paris, I completely agree. I'm so glad this movie ended the way that it did, particularly because of the emotional journey you go on through this film. Jordan Peele recognized a very specific need for a very specific feeling uh, towards the end of this film. And I'm so happy that they went that way. This movie for me has an, a 10 out of 10 ending. And I think something that was lost on me were some of the emotional ramifications and what that means for one of our other characters because of a decision that's made to walk away at a certain point. We'll get more into that in the spoiler half of the episode, but it absolutely blows my mind. Not only how tight the ending is, but how deep it is at the same time. You guys make really valid points. I felt like this movie had to end a certain way, and I was extremely happy on the way it ended. You know I like certain type of endings, um, certain type of characters and how it ends, so I'm just, without giving away too many spoilers, I enjoyed this movie and enjoyed the ending. Well, it feels like all this chatter bodes well for the movie, so let's go ahead and start making our way towards our ratings. Now, Alexis, before we actually scored, how many people died in this film? We have a total of eight bodies in this movie. And what about the animal report? Our animal report this week is interesting. We do have a good boy. We do have some rough things that happen to animals. It's kind of like a PETA wouldn't be stoked about it. It's not great. It's not the end of the world. As always, it's not P2, but it's it's not it's not good. Well, let's go ahead and get into our ratings then. Get Out by Jordan Peele from 2017. Was it a hacker slash? 
I'll just go really simply here. This movie is a slash for me. I'd, I'd not sure what anyone could find in it that would be a hack. Even if you don't love the movie, there's enough here that you have to appreciate. The acting in this movie is so good. The storytelling, the layers, there's so much. And these characters are built perfectly to be who they are. I think I have some things that I don't love. We all will with everything inevitably, but this movie is just really, really good. It's one of the things that I think has changed horror in our modern times. I think the past five years of horror would look completely different if Jordan Peele didn't step out with this. And I'm thankful that he did. I don't even know what else to say about it because it's just so simply a slash. I mean, what else can you say about Get Out, aside from the fact that it's wholeheartedly a slash? This is one of the brightest examples of superb modern horror. I enjoyed every minute of it, literally from start to finish, uh, even though it made me sweat for most of it. Um, if you're if you're like I was and you still have been waiting to watch this, stop. Today's the day. Go rent it. Go buy it. Borrow the Blu-ray from a friend if you still have one of those things. Um, do whatever you have to do. You have to see it. I really want to make my scoring a uh, cliffhanger, but I think it's obvious. <laughs> this movie is brilliant. It combines comedy, excitement, and social commentary on all these different layers. It's also menacing even from the first scene, and that just captured my attention. This movie is also beautiful, so I'm super excited to talk about the visuals with everyone. Like I mentioned, I'm surprised by the runtime, but I think it's because I just wanted to be in this movie, keep going. Maybe not necessarily in this movie, but I wanted to keep enjoying it and keep, you know, reliving this sort of experience that I had with this. So this is definitely getting a slash from me. Could you imagine if somebody hacked this movie? (laughs) Like we would just be, what? I thought you might just for shits i've never hacked anything just for shits i've always had very good reasoning listen back to the episodes to roll you. the tapes yeah to me yeah, that's all it, i can do all i can do is <laughs> share my reasonings um but this movie you you've all really said some really great points this is one of the greatest like modern horror movies of our time i think horror and comedy both share like a certain musicality that uses timing to convey a very specific very like potent emotional reaction and i think jordan peele's comedy background really translates so well into horror and it it reminded me of one of my probably one of my favorite horror movies of all time maybe my favorite which is your next something i loved the most about that was the way it used like realistic acting and performances to have naturally comedic moments that would occur in tragic situations that's something we kind of miss out on in a lot of horror movies it's very serious and very like we need to stay on this one tone but like if something insane happens somebody might say something funny about it and it might like have the briefest moment of levity or brevity and i think that is really brought to life in the way these characters are performed the acting in this movie bitch oh my god there's so many incredible scenes where it's just like give that an oscar give that an oscar give her an academy award give him an academy award and this movie i think is like chris mentioned doing really great things for getting horror taken seriously as far as like prestige recognition goes which i mean the award shows are kind of a scam so it's not huge but it would be nice you know what i mean uh, so this movie is absolutely a slash and i'm so excited that we got to review it well it's absolutely no surprise that get out is a universal slash because i'm not going to go any differently on this i've said a lot of good things so far so i'll leave you with this this movie is immaculate and it's layered and it is an absolute masterstroke of genius from jordan peele for this to be his directorial debut it's absolutely mind-blowing i would encourage you to not only watch this but then immediately after go watch horror noir a history of black horror that shows you it's not the first time someone has tried to say something and jordan peele was the man we needed at the time we needed him and this movie has made a statement and it's had a incredible societal impact and i'm so grateful for it but for now Get Out from 2017 is a universal slash. Now, you can find this movie available to rent. Hell, sounds like something you should actually just buy and treat yourself to owning this. But go check it out, then join us in the second half so we can dig into the spoilers together. We'll see you in a bit. Identity theft is a real and growing problem. 
But with BrainLock, you can protect yourself from the worst kind of identity theft, brain jacking. This is the worst case scenario for identity theft, but it's not just your credit score that's at risk, it's your whole life. Keep your BrainLock activated and you'll be immune to any attempt of brain jacking. BrainLock defends you against unauthorized access to your brain, keeping your thoughts and memories safe and secure. Brain theft affects millions of families every year, so don't let your corporeal vessel be hijacked by insidious caucasity. Welcome back, folks. You are now entering the spoiler zone for Get Out, which has earned a universal slash. Now, we have a lot to get to here, but before we get into the specifics of our ratings, we do have the matter of gore to attend to. Alexis, what's the gore score for this film? So for our audience, I did choose medium because I think what you get on screen, I even said it was so Saw 3 that if I had to make that reference, I couldn't give it a high gore rating, but I couldn't give it low either because it's in there. So I said medium because that brain surgery. Oh, yeah. Damn. That's all I have to say. That was mm, that was too much for me. The plopping of the skull cranium space into the trash can twice Mm -hmm. i know to me it's the even when you see it in saw that time where you know she's taking that instrument like it's not a saw but it's something that's rotating it is basically a saw it's basically a little mini circular circular saw there you go (laughs) but the sound that that makes it always hurts my teeth and even in this movie it hurt my teeth so bad it would hurt your teeth it was if it was being used on you as well, because it would <laughs> rattle your entire skull. Yeah, that is that is true. That is true. Well, there's a lot of deaths in this movie and a lot of people that deserve to be dead. So I'd love to hear what you guys think um, about your favorite deaths. I'm going to go first because you've mentioned mine, which was Jim Hudson and the exposed skull. And what a way to go, right? If the fire doesn't take him out first, he'll eventually wake up right? Because they've got him on some kind of medication. So he's going to wake up in excruciating pain, his brain exposed to the world. But he also has no idea what the hell's going on around him because he's blind. And so eventually he's just going to burn in a fiery death, which that character deserves. The layers of that? Yeah. Not something I had to consider the logistics of? Terrifying. Yeah, Mac, the more you really peel that back, it's a lot. Very brutal. And I have to follow that with the most welcome brutality I may have ever seen on screen. And that is obviously Papa Dean Armitage catching a deer to the neck and body. But his whole existence really was pierced with a with some deer antlers. Mm. And it was just like, a first off came out of nowhere. But second, it was just so full circle to stab him with that. And the way it went up into his neck and it was disgusting and it was perfect. Ooh, okay. Great bits of gore there. I'm going to follow up that Armitage with another Armitage, which was Rose, because holy shit, getting shot. And then, you know, Chris has his hands around his neck, then realizes it's better to let her suffer, to let her die slowly. But then when he walks away, he closes that loop, having been the kid who knows that his mom died on the side of the road, cold and alone and in pain. But to separate that, to think I don't have to latch on to just anyone, to separate and just make the choice to walk away from her as she dies cold alone on the side of the road, bleeding out. Such a journey for him and such an emotional journey for that death. Oh, for sure. Especially when she starts smiling. I'm like, this psycho. Oh, yeah. Bro, did you see the way she ate them Fruit Loops? That girl was off out of her mind. (laughs) It was a very deliberate thing, the way she ate those Fruit Loops. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Paris? Oh, that was my favorite kill, was Allison Williams getting shot and then choked out and then smiling like a dark-sided bitch. Can I vote a least favorite kill? Yes, you're allowed. Yeah, it's Walter just offing himself immediately. I mean, I get it. Listen, like, I think anybody in that situation knowing kind of what that experience could be like, like for on the inside, whoever is on the inside there, I can't imagine you would do anything else. But man, I was sad. I was like, oh, no. I thought we were going to, I thought we were going to be able to save someone. I think that when they explained the procedure, they made it pretty clear that like you would never be able to have full control because most of your brain's gone. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, well, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like you have that little bit of consciousness left, like just enough to know that something bad is happening to you every single day. And that's why I say like, it's totally understandable. I was just really hoping some people could get saved, you know? Yeah, that would have been great, you know, to have a little bit of optimism there. But man, to realize the situation he's in, to know that he's been a passenger in his own existence, 
then to have the wherewithal to grab the gun, shoot Rose, then take care of himself because he doesn't want that quality of life. I'm just happy he took Rose out first. Like he did, a, he he did, a, he he made a move by helping Chris. Yeah, and he knows that like that could be a short time frame where he's free there. Like, oh, insane. Ryan, I love Papa Dean. Is that what you called him? Papa Dean. Okay. <laughs> yes, you were saying it did come full circle. Dean is telling Chris about his disdain for deer after, you know, Chris is talking about how he hit the deer and, you know, later on being being killed by the mounted deer. Yeah, that is full circle. And honestly, he was just someone I just dislike. I don't like his voice. In general, I just don't like his voice. He's just annoying. And he just, when he's giving this tour of, of his house, you could just see like the bits and pieces of his personality coming through and or him trying so hard to hold back on everything that he probably really wants to say. I don't know. He just deserved to fucking die. Um, I'm just going to say that. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but what I really think is interesting is most of the characters who die in this movie, including the Armitages, have fatal head-related injuries. Um, however, these characters also, we can say, are pretty evil and monstrous. So it is said in various legends that one of the ways of killing a monster is by shooting him in the head decapitation or some execution of a sort dealing with the head so the armitages and jim hudson ended up proving to be evil people and they were killed off by head wounds and all sorts of things like that so i thought it was really interesting but speaking of being in people's heads so my favorite visual element is this close-up of georgina uh, when she's talking to chris when he's talking about the cell phone i believe and you see her her actual character trying to push through so she's saying no 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 so it's not even the context of that but it's her facial expressions going from smiling to not to smiling and that was honestly so terrifying but brilliant brilliant one hell of a performance there yeah georgina was giving the performance of a lifetime somebody who i also think gave a really great performance and contributed to my favorite visual element that you all actually kind of touched on a little bit was allison williams specifically in that slicked back ponytail with her little headphones, like listening to, what was it, Time of Your Life from Dirty Dancing and biting a single Fruit Loop in half while drinking milk through a straw. It was the most Caucasian thing I've ever seen. It was the most unhinged, psychotic thing I've ever seen. And I was like, this, drag her. You absolutely brought that character to life in that one moment. And then the whole time she's like Googling like NAACP prospects to like find her next victim. I was like, oh, this is like very Norman Bates, even though I've never seen that movie. It was that kind of vibe. But Paris, can you believe that this was her feature film debut? That quality performance from her first film. Oh, I mean, Alison Williams has been on my radar since Girls. Oh, I did not realize that that's what I've seen her in before. Mm. That's Marnie. That's why she's so good at playing like the most annoying white bitch ever. Not wrong. She's kind of typecast. Well, for me, I have to go for a very, very specific detail. And I thought one of you would have gone for it as well. So hopefully I'm not taking Max, but it is Andre's eyes when oh, he yes. gets that picture snapped of him. The way they have a... It's interesting because what really happens is the light leaves his eyes. But what it really is, is like makes his eyes go from this look that is doll-like to his actual eyeballs. And it's just so small, but it communicates so much of what's going on. And the first time it happens, it's before we know anything. And they kind of repeat that scene a few times throughout, you know, as he's kind of like flashing back. But before we like really know the details of what's going on, you see his eyes change in that moment. And you're like, oh, things are not okay here. It's perfect. Those are the things that I live for in a movie. Isn't it also interesting that that's the mechanic that triggered this when you think about like some cultures and their perception that taking a photo of you steals your soul. And in this movie, it uses a device to almost like help someone else regain their soul. That's true. It's also interesting that three of us have chosen to focus on eyes or facial expressions because that's also one of my favorite things visually about this movie is Daniel Kaluuya's face, mm. especially in the scene where he's trying to escape the house and he's like, babe, give me the keys. And he goes through like so many stages of processing this whole thing. Yeah, like it's a joke at first. Like these right. white people wouldn't be trying to keep me in this house. 
I just like when he gets to the end and like realizes that he can't escape and that she's betrayed him and you could just feel it. it you could feel tears welling in his eyeballs. And I don't know how he was able to do it, but pure magic. And I think they did us a, a great service here by focusing on the characters, of course, but being able to get close enough to their face to where we could like make out all the details we needed to make out. Mac, I love that you point that moment out. And that's something that that di- bit of dialogue, that exchange between uh, he and Rose and that moment with the keys, a lot of that was improv in that line. You know, I can't give you the keys, right, babe? was a a pool and they decided to build on that relationship this chris is so in love with her chris you know even though he knows that she's in on the plot he's still so in love with her he wants to think there's a way and it's not until he finally gives up and resigns himself to that fact that she then drops all the pretense so i love that you point that out particularly because you know proximity to the face is something else that's present in what was my favorite visual, and that's just the transition and then the existence in the sunken place. It is absolutely stunning how they were able to pull this off. At this point, he as an actor is attached to wires, and he's floating in front, of, in front of a black background, giving the performance of a lifetime. And to see that pulling back from what's similar to like a TV pulling back into his own consciousness, suspended in air, suspended in a place where you can't really hear, right? I think it reminds me of that, what is that alien tagline in space, no one can hear you scream, but in your own mind, no one can hear you scream. I think that also takes me into that favorite scene because it's the power of that. It's this reality that he's been vulnerable with Rose, but he doesn't want to be vulnerable in this moment. And she is, without his consent, tapping into that vulnerability. And slowly but surely, all his walls are coming down and he's trying to fight to keep them up for his own protection, really. But then it's also like the visual representation of that. And there's a point where I read Jordan Peele's commentary on The Sunken Place. And he said, the sunken place means we're marginalized. No matter how hard we scream, the system silences us. So it's not even just him being silenced in his own subconscious, him being frozen in time, him thinking about the guilt that he carries from his mother. But again, tying back into the greater representation of what this movie means in the context of our society. I I, I read that, Chris, and it was just like so impactful. And when when I got to the scene where Andre like hits the, you know, the flash hits his eyeballs and he like, you know, breaks this character, this person who's taken over his, his body and is able to tell him to like, get out, get the F out. Um, like that of course is shocking, but the entire build up to that point, I think is way more shocking. The exchange is so completely uncomfortable. It is like watching, we've mentioned vampires earlier. It's like watching vampires chatting casually with their prey about how they're going to eat them. And it's, it's insane. I think the entire film loves to point this out that these people who think that they're not doing anything wrong because like, oh, we, we don't hate you. We just, you know, want to take over you. Um, they think they have the right to control you and to decide what's best for you and that you don't have that right. And that moment, they're like clearly, they're hungry, you know, almost like they're ready to, to take complete control over you because they don't think that you have it. So yeah, the, the moment where he snaps out of it, is is wow but everything leading up to that is just it's absolutely insane mac that was also my favorite scene is this whole party where chris is essentially just literally on display for these people and you know he's essentially sort of sold he well i shouldn't say sort of he is sold and he's off in the distance trying to figure out what's going on and this other this other scene where it's bingo, but I don't even know what was, I mean, I knew what was going on. I don't know the context per se, but it was just weird. You know, everyone's going up to him and whatever they were lacking or whatever they wanted. Oh, you know, you're strong. Oh, your eyesight. Oh, you know, you're fashionable. I love your fashion because these are what these people like want. And it was just interesting to see that because seeing it for a second time, I know the first time I was like, oh, it's a party. And then I saw later, I'm like, oh, he's being sold, auctioned off. And then in this watching this, and I'm just like every little thing that they did, they're wearing red, the people that are initiated into this, you know, sort of cult. And 
even when they walk upstairs and it's just dead silent from everyone and they're listening, it, it was just like a terrifying moment. And I just felt for him really bad because I wish he could pick up more, which I give him credit and I can't wait till we talk about characters, but he gets a lot of credit for being one of the smarter protagonists in a movie. But at that point I was like, can you see this? Can you see this? Please see this. Yeah, it's that party is insane. And my favorite scene is not one, it's a few and they're kind of sprinkled throughout, but it's one specific thing that's happening. And one of them happens in that party too. Specifically, this comes from the second watch and the information that the grandparents are within Georgina and Walter. And so when you know that, and then you rewatch and watch Chris's interactions when he is seeking comfort from another black person there. So it happens when he first gets there. It happens at the party. Happens with Georgina, like just kind of trying to like tap in. Once you realize who's there, those interactions are insane because it's like this some old white dude. So my understanding is basically Tom, Andre, is probably that woman's husband who was dying, right? And so like there's so many creepy things happening like oh we're home buddies now like y'all just y'all just in the house having sex all the time that's weird that's what it seemed like to me and then he like shows off his new body like all that stuff is so weird and there's just some creepy old white dude in there and he knows this dude from back in the day and of course like the icing on the cake for that is putting out a fist and getting a hand on top of it like oh yeah the <laughs> most they focus on that too yeah the most obvious form of miscommunication between white and black people is the handshake and it's just like that uh, all of those scenes are amazing especially once you realize like the deep layers of who he's actually talking to versus who he thinks he's talking to Y'all took my favorite scene. It's the party. It's the best scene in the whole movie. The party scene does such a good job of relaying all of these microaggressions into something that is so much more sinister. And even watching it the first time, it's so uncomfortable. Even when you don't know that everything is going on underneath the surface, it's just like, oh, you just get the tiniest little glimpse into what it must be like to be a black person in a predominantly white scenario. Also, just like even being a white person at an all white party, like pretty much every family reunion I've had is just painfully Caucasian and it's not fun. And everything everybody says is just like, Oh God, why did you say that? Stop talking. Uh, so just like, I can't imagine what that experience is like, but I love the way that the scene really builds into this really interesting, like allegory and parallel between like what are like basically culture vultures and relaying them to a system of oppression and a system of slavery and racism that has inherently benefited them this whole time. But now it's sort of flipped because like, oh, we want what you have because like we're boring and white and jealous and we want like whatever quality it is that you possess that we don't see in ourselves. Uh, so I just thought it was like a really elegant way to kind of relay a sadly timeless experience to something that is more modern with like cultural appropriation and how people just want to get the clout of another culture without having to deal with any of the consequences of being from that culture. Yeah, this movie does an insanely complex thing where it walks this line between showing racism and insensitive comments and then on the other side showing this like perverted obsession. And it's it's so weird to have both of those things in one movie. I feel like usually if we have things that veer towards racism, that's pretty much where they stay because that's such a heavy, serious topic. But then the other side of it is a, is a, an, a different issue where it's like the, you know, we want to be you, which is a whole other weird next level. Uh, strange thing to do. And they balance so well. Like the way you have to write this for those two things to work together is amazing to me. And the actors play it completely perfectly. I mean, all these old people are so gross. They're all exactly who they seem like they should be. And then you almost think you have like a good guy in the blind guy and you don't. Jim Hudson sucks just as much as all the rest of them. You think he's going to be like cool for a second because he sat down and talked to Chris, but no, he, he sucks too. It's, I don't know. This is a bit of a masterpiece and the party scene, I think is like the piece de resistance. I think it's such a great moment of summing up just the exact mix of characters that you have, Ryan. And you put that in a very beautiful way, especially when you think that Chris finds comfort in exactly one other person at that party and it's another artist or someone who appreciates art and sees him as more than just a body. And I think the constant objectification of Chris and Andre and this whole reliance on seeing people as black bodies and not as people 
and uh, as an asset to trade or auction or to, uh, to, to covet, but not see or place value in as another human being. This movie is so rich in the way that it explores that idea through all of its nuanced performances. And it took me back into watching this the second time and knowing everyone's intentions. And that moment when Rose sticks up for Chris with the cop. And you realize that she's not standing up for him and she's just avoiding a paper trail. Fuck that hurts. Dude, as soon as it happened, I was like, oh, I forgot that she seems like a good person for so long. I mean, she does so good seeming like a good person. And then she sucks. Honestly, Allison Williams has great performances from everything that I've seen her in. I've seen her in exactly two things, this and the perfection. But She was so convincing. And I know that Jordan Peele fought really hard in, in, you know, the structure of the screenplay and looking at the dynamic between Chris and Rose. He wanted to be completely convincing with no question otherwise that they are absolutely in love. And it's absolutely wild to me. You know, Alexis, I know you were going to mention this earlier, the duality to Rose in that performance and to know that. Rose is actually two different people and Allison Williams plays her as two different people. Even in that moment when Chris is on the phone with Rod and she's trying to like casually playfully flirt with Rod. And then you see how she completely flips on that later on. Absolutely mind blowing. She's just so calculated. And, you know, I definitely like pick up on those, Chris, and even the smoking part where she's like, hey, this isn't good for your body. She didn't even say health. I think she said this isn't good for your body. And I'm thinking, okay, well, it's because they're about to give your body to some other guy. I don't want you to be smoking, you know? (laughs) So it was just those things and just watching that. And especially in that scene where she says, you know, I can't give you the keys, babe. That was the light switch that it that room got so dark and pitch black. And you're like, I'm not sure where to go. Like I, it, it was just terrifying when she had said that because I was like, she's the most brutal out of all of these people. I just need to like drop in for a quick second. They're amazing. Their chemistry was amazing. They were a very believable couple. Comma, however, if you are with somebody for five months and weird stuff starts happening at their family's house, you should definitely leave. Five months is not long enough for this. Mm-hmm. This is not a five month commitment. This is all like, like he really, he really could have rolled out. I really thought that it, this felt like a couple years long relationship, unless they were doing a thing where like they've been really close and friends for a couple years. But looking at her rate and, um, you know, how often she's going through guys, it ha- absolutely had to have been just met and then maybe a month later started dating. I have a very different take, I think on Rose from probably everyone else because she was suspicious to me from the very start. There was just a feeling I got from her. I just felt like her and her family, I felt like these are people that I've that I've met in real life. And I feel like she's the kind of girl that would tell her parents, hey, this is my black boyfriend, Chris. And she would tell her friends, oh yeah, I got a black boyfriend. That's who she seemed to me to to be as a person. And her parents, oh yeah, we know her parents. We got we got Missy and Dean. Dean probably reads Mother Jones and the Atlantic every single day. And Missy has I don't know, 15 different types of crystals and likes to tell you that she was a hippie back in the day or something like that, right? Where they're just like so open and liberal and they like have to make you aware of that fact. And I think that line, you know, that I would have voted for Obama for a third term if I could have or whatever, like that was just to me the perfect depiction of who Dean was as a person. But like this whole family, I, I know this family because like, I have dated people in, in, in my past, right? And one of them was a white northern liberal who like at a get together with other people, I was, so I was dating the girl. This girl's mother goes like, Oh yeah, my daughter dates black men at a party or a get together of some sort. And I was just like, that's an incredibly awkward thing to say to strangers. Like that's not something you would say to other people in public. Unprovoked. So yeah, this whole family, I, I just completely knew this whole family. And yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, but Rose was suspicious from the moment we met her. Drag those white people, Mac. Listen, white people, old white people are so weird about the things that they say. Like, yes, I will attest to this. This movie has a little bit of dramatics, but, but a dad walking in the backyard with his daughter's black boyfriend saying, if I could have voted for Obama a third time, I would have feels so realistic 
it's not even like the slightest bit made up. I feel like there's probably a couple billion people that have said that before. It's insane. Why people say weird stuff, okay? Weird, weird stuff. It's the way that they all took every possible opportunity to be like, I'm one of the good ones. I'm not racist. And it's like, me thinks doth protest too much. It's very like, <laughs> like for the longest time, my mom used to be like, oh, I don't see color. And in recent years, I've had to really kind of break it down for her as like, hey, it's important to see color uh, because otherwise you're overlooking marginalized people's experiences and it's actually not the the proud anti-racist sentiment you think it is. So it's just like, I don't know, it's our job to like really keep the white people in our lives in check because somebody has to. I mean, and then we've got Jeremy and Jeremy also seems very much like a real person that you probably met in college. Oh, like the biggest redneck? Not even redneck, just like super douche for some reason just like that super douche that thinks they can get away with anything because they just because that's who they are and they come from money yes and they come from money but very like you know if your brother met your boyfriend and it was like okay who's gonna beat each other up first kind of thing but like also throwing that your brother's racist then it's like an added layer of everything he says too and you know what chris is a phenomenal protagonist in this movie I mean, he does smart things, although a little slow in the middle of the movie to catch on to things. But I think he just had a really good intention with Rose that he was just like, people, I mean, I assume he knows people are like this, but maybe he was like, well, she doesn't seem like this. Her parents probably, I, I don't know where he was going, but he was smart. There was a point where Jeremy was kicking the door and he knew that he was going to try to reach for that again because Jeremy was going to kick the door and stabbed. And I, I like someone, you know, a protagonist that's very forward thinking, thinking about the future, thinking about a lot of that. And I love how he didn't kill Rose because I fucking would have. And I probably would have that on my conscience the rest of my life. But fuck it. I mean, he knew she was going to die. That That's important. She died really fast, though, right after. But yeah. <laughs> I want to defend him in the middle there because it's like a real hard leap to go from I was at my apartment two days ago chilling with my dog and now I'm with my girlfriend and her family is trying to hypnotize me, take my body, put someone else's brain inside of me and uh, ba I'm, I'm basically gone and sell me to somebody for that. Like, it's a far reach. It's really real slow for any of us to catch on to that. I guess so. You wouldn't think that because but also this is a movie so <laughs> but but i think i'm thinking more of the language that was used during the party but i think he was already catching on to that but white people are this weird all the time well they did joke about it just being he was gonna be like a their like sex doll or something i don't know yeah it, like, it's just like i think this movie does a really interesting thing where it highlights like did it like so many people do just be saying this and it's not because they're going to buy me and put their brain inside of me. It's just because they're weird and they say weird stuff. But also, I'm sorry, if if I go to your parents' house and your mom says, I can hypnotize you for whatever reason, I would say like, no, thank you. I would if say she yes. then <laughs> hypnotized me against my will somehow, because I don't believe in it anyway, um, I would leave as soon as I realized that that had happened to me if yeah. I had been able to. Of course, if I actually was hypnotized, maybe I wouldn't be able to. But if I knew like... They have hypnotized me. I'd be like, I'm on a bus. I don't even care. I'm out of here. You didn't get my consent to do this. This is why men should drive. This wouldn't have happened if he drove. He could have rolled out at yeah. any point. Mm -hmm. I don't think you're making Chris very happy at all. No. No, she doesn't support that, but it's fine. No, this is why I think you should meet there. You should have your own transportation out. That part. No, I don't like driving separately. Then we have so much time. Like, car rides are great. I support some parts of the patriarchy, and the ones that say men drive are... <laughs> Are the ones I'm on board for. <laughs> oh I agree. I'm I'm with you, Ryan. Wow, my heart hurts. Okay, so we've we've talked a little bit about the the parents, and I think that those types of people are the worst part of this movie. The people that are not even in this movie, the ones who will see this movie and think, "I am so glad that I am one of the good ones." So it's a complaint against a straw man. I, I know that. But at the same time, I know that these people exist and they'll probably have this reaction to this movie. Yeah. The people out there who are exactly like this, that are watching this and like, oh, I'm not like that. Completely delusional and unaware. Exactly. I, I didn't go as broad. Um, I said Jeremy was the worst part of this movie because I just think he didn't add shit. No. Okay. A hundred percent. Jeremy is the worst part of this movie because not only did he not add shit, he almost was like negative shit. He detracted a little bit of shit from me. What was up? Was he playing the ukulele? Is that what that was? I'm not sure. I actually 
referred to this early in the episode that Jeremy was one of my worst parts. I think maybe this time around it was a little bit better because I really pieced together that he was the one uh, in the opening scene that abducted uh, our guy who ended up coming to the party. But his whole monologue at the dinner scene, I was like, ugh, you're a gross person. And like, I get that you're acting, but if you're this good at acting like this, part of you is also gross as an actor. And I don't know that man, but I'm sorry to him. Uh, but I did find a pretty glaring continuity error that I had to rewind and really double back to confirm. And that is also going to be thrown into my worst part moment. And it's the grandma in the car right before it crashes, has a scar, like, from her incision, like, the, the obviously the brain surgery, and it's like a thick scar about an inch below her hairline. Then the car crashes into the tree, and all of a sudden the scar is very thin, and it's exactly at her hairline. And I was like, hmm, what was that? Was that a reshoot? Clearly the skin move, you know, she got little flaps. <laughs> yeah, and the <laughs> scar tissue halved. So Paris, was that the character that you would have removed? Was Jeremy? Jeremy? Yeah. Yeah. Get rid of Jeremy. Cut Jeremy out. But like, I, even the line where the blind guy was like, like, you're one of the lucky ones because Rose is how you got here because I've heard Jeremy's methods are much worse where he's like terrorizing you in a creepy metal hood and being a, just a abductor of humans, human trafficker. I just think that he, he can, he, he adds to the family, unfortunately. Like he gives them this edge because they're all very well rounded and he's clearly the loose cannon and like, he doesn't seem like super stoked about it. He, he's just kind of like there. He, he's the black sheep kind of, of the family, you know, and I think, I think he sucks, but he gives it a balance that they need. He, he didn't bother me at all. And that continuity error, I think I kind of noticed because the scars were so prominent in those scenes at the end with Georgina and Walter because we hadn't seen them before. I kind of paid attention to it, but it didn't bother me. I have like a, um, somewhat really, really unpopular thing that I'm going to say here for my worst part. And it's, that sometimes the scenes and the storyline with Rod were a bit forced. Like he was hilarious and I'm thankful he was there, but it was like, we need somebody on the outside. Like the whole story could have been without him and I'm not saying that it should have been, but there were just some points and I could, I remember feeling this more the first time I watched it where I was just like, all right, he's got like a funny friend. Like, I don't know, the funny friend trope is it's a, little, it's a little played for me. And sometimes I didn't love it, even though I did really enjoy Rod as a character in general. There were just some moments that were a little too much for me. I loved Rod because Rod was us. Rod was the audience. And that was the best part. That's right. And and I'm I'm okay with being the only person that feels this way. Definitely an unpopular opinion. I just don't, I, mean, I don't know. I don't like forced funny and while I think it's real, like realistic in some respects, it just, I don't know, there's just a couple of moments where it's just a little bit off for me. I will say I'm jealous that all of you have seen this before, um, because this being my first viewing, like I picked up on a lot of stuff during it, but there's more that I didn't pick up on. And I would definitely like to watch this again to have the experience you all had. I probably won't rewatch it for a while. I do also want to just mention one last thing. The bit at the end where Rod pulls up and obviously you see police lights and you think it's the cops and he's on top of a white woman was insane in the theater. Like that moment at the end of this movie where it had already been like a scream at the TV kind of theater experience. It was amazing. And even this time, as soon as it happened, I was like, oh no. And then I remembered. And that was the thing I talked about <laughs> earlier that was just like such an insane feeling when this movie came out, but I won't rewatch it for a while. Yeah. Seeing it twice, you know, I picked up on what I needed to. But I feel like I, you could watch this a million times and pick up on more things. Um, so I feel like it's going to be some time removed before I watch this. I actually for sure want to watch this movie again and I want to watch it soon. But Ryan, hearing you talk about your theater experience watching this movie makes me really sad that I didn't get to experience this in a theater. So maybe actually no, because we can't travel back in time to a point where no one had seen this movie. I was going to say, maybe if it's one of those ones, like, kind of kind of the Nero uh, back home, it would occasionally play older horror movies. If this was, if it was that kind of situation, I'd love to see this on the big screen. But I think what I really crave is the experience of filling a big room with a big screen full of people who've never seen this before. And I want to have that feeling, watching them watch this movie. 
It's really something. Okay, but Chris, take this maybe as a sign that moving forward, if a movie is getting a lot of hype and it is in theaters, don't do that thing that you say you do where you wait until the hype is over and then watch it for the first time years later. First first of all, Paris, I don't do that intentionally with theatrical movies. What I do do that with is streaming because then it spreads like fucking wildfire. Typically, if a movie is in theaters and I have an interest in seeing it, I'll go see it without a problem. I just simply did not have the time to do so when this movie came out. What about A Quiet Place? You like took a stand and you're like, whenever a movie's too popular and getting too much hype, I wait for it all to die down because I don't want to be disappointed. I wasn't that interested in John Krasinski, I'll be honest. Okay, so that was the real reason. We finally find 100 episodes later. (laughs) Not 100 episodes later. Interested, but not so interested that I like feel like I have to go watch it. But also the hype, I needed that time to pass so I could... I could set John Krasinski aside. Not even that I dislike him. I just, I think Jim, Jim Halpert is just fucking toxic in the office. And I don't want to marry those two things in my mind with a movie. Fair and valid. Uh, definitely going to watch this again. This movie has a lot of rewatch value. Mac, you should definitely watch it a second time. The sooner the better, probably, because you can have all of this fresh in your mind and watch it the second way, which is a completely new watch. Like, you definitely can't watch this movie the same way twice. Agreed, Paris. Mac, absolutely should rewatch this while this is all fresh in your mind. But let's see what else you have fresh on your mind with your fact or fiction. Number one, Daniel Kaluuya was so perfect during his audition that he did five takes of a scene in which he cries and a tear rolled down his face at the exact same time in each take. I've seen him in Black Mirror and he is phenomenal, so I'm going to say fact. He do be crying. (laughs) It's such a specific thing, but you got me, Uncle Fact. I feel like there was a storyline where he really wanted this role, but wasn't their first pick, maybe. So let's just say fiction. Well, this one's a fact, and he was given the role of Chris on the spot. So he performed so well during the audition, and I think that's pretty obvious after you see him in the actual film. Number two, Chris and Rod interacted only over the phone in every scene but the ending, and the actors were actually on real phone calls while filming. This is pretty cool fact. Why would that be? I- I'll go fiction. Hmm. I feel like the first part's fiction, but the second part's fact. So where does that leave us? No, he, they, they weren't together at any point. I'll say fact. Yes, this one is a fact. They were on the phone when they were on the phone, but they were actually talking to Jordan Peele. Mm, that makes more sense. Yeah. I was like, why would they call each other? Like, they're not even probably on set at the same time right. filming these things. <laughs> Number three, the film operated on a small budget by modern standards and was shot in only five weeks to remain within budget. I mean, it was kind of short, but that has nothing to do with anything. It's literally not short. <laughs> it just felt short when you, I was like, that's it? <laughs> this is an hour 45. Technically, it was long by our know, standards. It was, like, it, it was. I'm going to say fiction. You're lying on a number. I think that probably was a, a pretty tight budget. It was his first shebang, you know? I don't know anything about budgets, so I will say fiction. This probably filmed in under five weeks, maybe even four So, this one is a fiction, but I'm kind of disappointed because Chris gave us the answer at the start of the episode, and that was 23 days. You know we don't pay attention. (laughs) That's usually the part of the episode where Chris really, like, blows my mind. She's like, this movie was made with a paper towel roll and a pinhole camera. No, that's the Phantom of the Opera mask. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. No one was allowed to shower. (laughs) And I'm like, what? Well, number four, Jordan Peele wanted Bradley Whitford for the role of Dean because he wanted the Armitages to have a certain white liberal feel. Oh, God. If he didn't do it on purpose, he did great on accident. So I'll go fact, 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 that part. This is a fact. Yeah, Whitford hit that vibe earlier in a role on The West Wing. That's been fact or fiction. Well, there you have it, folks. Get Out has unsurprisingly earned a universal slosh. Now, we've had a lot to talk about here, but it doesn't end here by any means. We want to know what you specifically think. Keep in mind, there are a number of ways you can reach out to us, starting with our website, hackerslash.live, or on our social media accounts on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And dude, if you're a hypnotist, we'd love to hear from you. You can reach out to our Hacker Slash hotline by leaving us a voicemail at 757-606-0128 or visit hackerslash.live to send us an audio message. Or if you're like me and you don't believe in hypnotism, you can send us an email to feedback at hackerslash.com. If you've enjoyed listening to this episode, consider becoming one of our patrons. You can visit patreon.com slash hacker slash to earn cool perks for as low as $1 a month. We'll see you next time, folks. And remember, even the sun will die someday. Bye. Um. 
So having reviewed this week, Jordan Peele's first real big hit horror movie, um, I thought we should talk about his upcoming movie, which is actually going to be releasing its very first trailer just a couple days after this episode drops. Are y'all aware of Nope? Nope. Chicken. <laughs> nope. <laughs> I saw it, but I really thought it was like a new Disney movie. The way it's like kind of animated, like up, but nope. <laughs> I mean, I don't... I could see that. I don't know if animated is the word. All I know is that last year in July, he posted the picture one year before it was going to release. And I was immediately like looking for tickets because I can't read dates and I'm an idiot. But I'm really excited for it. I don't even know. I mean, we... I, Paris, do you have theories of what you think it's about? Do you know what it's about? No, nobody does at this point. They're, that's why I'm so excited for the trailer that comes out on Sunday. But the poster is definitely compelling. Also, just like the title, Nope, and the fact that Kiki Palmer is in it, who I love. Also, Daniel. Of course, Daniel Kalia, obviously. But Kiki Palmer, I think, does not get enough opportunities. Um, even though she's literally everywhere, I feel like she just needs to book everything. Uh, so I'm super excited for this. They did release like a little like trailer for the trailer that came out today as of this recording. And all just, it's just like a clip of Daniel, Kiki, and Steven, Steven Yen. Uh, and they're all just like looking up into the sky yeah. like, <gasps> oh my God, I didn't know it was Glenn from Walking Dead. Neither did I. Hey, it's Glenn from The Walking Dead. <laughs> there you go. They're probably just looking up at the sky and being like, uh, nope. <laughs> exactly. It seems to be the case. It seems to be the case. <laughs> but what is it? Like, obviously, so the poster is a big storm cloud in a, in a sky above a little city. And then there's just like this long, like, string of flags coming out of it. Yeah. Like a kite. Yeah. Almost like a kite. Is it climate change? I'm guessing it's a good mix between it, but then that movie with Mark Wahlberg about how all the, the happening. Yes. It's a very good mix of that. <laughs> I don't know. There's definitely some like flying objects in that cityscape. I don't even know if cityscape is the right way to, to say that, but I don't know. I hope it's something exciting. I have never been disappointed that I watched a Jordan Peele movie. True. Very true. I've left it always confused, but at very well entertained. I am curious if it's anything like Salem's Lot, if that storm cloud is like bringing evil to this town in some way. I don't know. I'm, I'm intrigued. Yeah, what if it's like the fog, but up? No. I feel like the storm cloud is very much like sucking things up into it or something. Oh. I don't know. I feel like it pulled that little whatever it is up into it, and everyone that sees it happening is like, nope, get me out of here. Well, y'all know I won't be watching the trailer, so I can't wait to hear what you think about it, but don't tell me about it. I wait, don't want to know. But it's going to play during the Super Bowl, and you will be watching the Super Bowl in its commercials. Oh, is that when it's debuting? Yes. I'll probably look away. I'll do my best. <laughs> Jordan Peele got money. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. But just like Super Bowl culture. Why is that still a thing? Why are you so anti me? I'm going to be honest. I've never seen a Super Bowl. Yeah, same. Wow, you're hating on one, but you've never seen one before? I'm never going to watch one of those. One of those games. <laughs> And then all the good Just commercials come up show. on the on the internet later. Oh, I have actually watched a couple halftime shows in my life. But it's like, you could just do a show. First off, <laughs> I, I taught Chris to love football this year. Maybe not love, watch, in the past like two years. So anyone can, anyone can join. And also, you can just say the thing that my roommate says, which is, no one cares about the Super Bowl. We're just here for the commercials, which is infuriating when you do care about the Super Bowl. Mm. Yeah, I feel like the issue is that people still care about the Super Bowl. Why do you hate me? Okay, so... I care. Who are you rooting for? That's my question. Oh. I hope the Bengals. Yeah, I'm rooting for the Bengals. Thank you. So I'm weird like this. I'm, I've been talking about sports teams at work a lot, and um, I don't really have that like that many favorites, but I do have states that I will never root for for some reason. And typically it's Texas and uh, California. Well, you have to root against the home team. And also though, Joe Burrows is like a white boy wearing a chain. So he's not going to win, which is unfortunate. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I, I hijacked this conversation, <laughs> but isn't he on the team that you're rooting for? Yeah, sure. Yeah, they're, uh, they would be the underdogs and I generally go for underdogs if I don't care. Okay. Understood. I did learn how to watch football from Ryan over the last couple of years, but also I'm the kind of person who only cares about a home team. So if the, unless the Dolphins are ever in the Super Bowl, I'm literally never going to give a shit, which is crazy because they used to be all the time. Hey, they were mm -hmm. pretty good this year. 
For the dolphins, yeah. For the dolphins, <laughs> yeah. Okay, Ryan, I googled Joe Burrow, and he absolutely has Chet Hanks energy, so that does track. I, I'm not saying me. I'm just saying, like, the world won't let him win. Trust me. We really just relegated to football, didn't we? Yeah, why are we talking about football? I don't know, because we're excited to see the trailer during the Super Bowl. That's why we got into football. And, I mean, I think it's a great choice because you're going to get a lot of people watching the Super Bowl who are going to see the trailer. I also just wish you would just put the trailer out ASAP. I just don't want it to give away a bunch of details. And also, it's so long before we get to see it. I just don't want to have accidentally watched it and be mad about it. I just feel like trailers give so much away. I have a feeling that, I mean, this this like release strategy looks like it's not going to. Yeah. I think so, too. Also, Jordan Peele is not here for un- unveiling his secrets. Yeah, maybe, exactly. Maybe the spirit is they put out a decor trailer and really the title of the movie is, oh, is that what you thought it was? Nope. And then it's something else mm. entirely. Mm. That is totally plausible. <laughs> it could be so many things. I just think it's interesting. So I've watched this video of Jordan Peele and it's just funny because he was on Mad TV on Key and Peele. And it's just hilarious, but I saw him like kind of debunk all of these theories people had about this movie. And he's just funny. Like he's straight up like, that's a good idea, but no, I just threw that in. Like, <laughs> so we'll have to drop it in the show notes. Regardless of what this movie ends up being, we know it's going to have uh, some really great psychological elements as well as some good comedy moments. I, I just live for the psychological elements. And does it always make sense? Is it always a perfect story from Jordan Peele? No, because he goes so far outside of the norms, but I don't care. I'm here for all of it. Us is like one of my favorite movies. Like I watched it like four times when it came out. Have you ever heard me say that about anything ever? Yeah. No, but I'm still very sad you never ended up being tethered, Ryan. I know. Oh, Ooh, that's terrifying. I own a giant pair of gold scissors. Just for that? for the yeah, I, yeah, I was going to be that for Halloween and then realize that maybe that wasn't a good idea to show up to a bar with a gigantic yeah. <laughs> metal scissors. <laughs> now the scissors are just for cutting this episode and lesbian jokes. You really joined the podcast in 2018 and waited until 2022 for us to get to it, huh? You had to cut that out, right? I'm pretty sure it was 2019 that he joined. I thought that was a little, yeah. a little early. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm thinking about my last year. I just didn't get out much, but I did watch this movie when it became... Hmm? You didn't get out much. <laughs> <laughs> and it's literally exactly what you think it is. I don't know what I think it is. How could you know what I know, what I think? What do you think it is? Is it not a good ending? Because what I what I read is that he gets arrested, but not shot. Oh, the end, end, end. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yes. I see. I see. Sorry, I didn't know we were talking about all the way at the end. The animal report is good to go. There is a... Oh, God bless. <laughs> yeah, that's not going to be... Yep, that's a bad... That's not a good answer. I forgot that's my job. You, like, choke me, Nanny. Kind of like how you got to go for the head with a zombie, you know? Do you, and va- vampires are in the, in the heart. And very interesting. Very different. Because they're not real. <laughs> <laughs> but zombies are? Also not real. <laughs> <laughs> I would say zombies are real in a certain context. M- me sometimes. Focusing on the characters, of course, but being able to get close enough to their face to where we could like make out all the details we needed to make out. Yeah, close enough to make out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Ryan. I had to. Yeah. Yeah. Very normal thing with, you know, coagulas. Much like Chris said, you cannot watch this movie the first way twice. The same way twice? Same way twice, but (laughs) first way. Yeah, but like the second and third times are probably the same way twice. Oh, no. I don't know about that. You know what I'm trying to say. (laughs) Yeah, gonna need you to say it. You definitely can't watch this movie the same way twice. My great uncle was on the West Wing. Was it him? That's cool. No, it's not him. He's real old. Well, he's not alive anymore, but he was real old. No. Oh, was he an extra? He was like an, uh, like an extra actor. Mm. You have a line every once in a while. Nice. He was like the door opener on the West Wing or something, like when they went into the main office or something like he that. He spoke that makes him an actor. 